Choosing an Atmos rig. Today we're going to dig into a whole bunch of stuff behind how to choose the gear for your Atmos rig. Uh, we're going to talk about a bunch of the specs that you need to meet. And then at the end, toward the second half of this video, uh, we're going to get into my Atmos rig, what the gear that I'm choosing. Now, this is not meant to be a sales pitch. This is not meant to tell any of you what to get. This is just explaining the system, and this is explaining how to choose, like the thought process behind choosing the gear, and then letting you see what gear I chose and explaining the reasons why I chose that gear. Let's get into it. Hey everyone, I'm Cole Caparoon. Thank you for stopping by for another video. Now, I am fully aware of how polarizing a topic Atmos is. So all of you naysayers, all of you haters, I love you. What I would like for you to do, those of you that are here to hate, I want you to drop a comment down below. I want you to leave all the hate you want in the comments. And I want you to do that first of all because it will help this video out. The more hate you guys leave in the comments, the more the YouTube algorithm is gonna send this out to people who might actually get some use from it. And the second reason I want you to drop all the hate in the comments is because I want a written record. I want, to, I want something to look back at in 10 years and see who is on the right side of this. Not that there's right and wrong sides, but I'm just kind of half goofing around. I know there's gonna be a ton of hate, drop it down below. Uh, for those of you that are not here to hate, that are genuinely interested in this Atmos thing, in how to choose a rig, in what all goes into this, uh, this is going to be the foundation. This is video one, episode one, in an entire Atmos series that I'm doing. We're going to talk about everything from acoustic treatment to choosing the rig, the gear itself, how to tune the room, where to position the speakers. Eventually, once I get way deep into this, then we'll do some mixed tutorial stuff as well. So if you're interested in that, subscribe if you haven't yet already. This is not going to be a short video. This is going to be a very long, in-depth video. I want you to know that this is not a sales pitch. I also want you to know that Sweetwater did not give me all of this gear for free. I've seen a lot of comments like that. Sweetwater absolutely did not give me all of this gear. So, but this video is sponsored by Sweetwater and I will put links down below uh, for every piece of gear that I talk about in this video and we'll talk more about that later. So first to help set a foundation of what we should be looking at, how to choose speakers, how to choose speaker placements, what to think about when you're choosing your interfaces and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I had my good buddy Josh from Focal over. He was kind enough to come over and kind of give me a long interview style rundown of things to think about, things to be conscious of, how to make some decisions and the specs necessary that we need to meet. Josh has set up a ton of Atmos rooms at this point, and so I, I'm very glad that he was able to come over and help share a lot of information with me and with all of you. So let's get to that and then once we're done going over like the specs and the the needs for atmos and and like how to choose the rig then we'll get into the gear that i chose and uh we'll just work our way through it all right here we go give me like the breakdown of like how do you decide what speakers to go with for your system because there's a there's a minimum spl right at yeah the same position. so can you explain that there's really two two primary factors one the size of the room to the distance you want the speakers to be from you inside the room. I think uh, initially there was an assumption that the speakers were always going to be on the outside of the wall, you know, on the on the boundary of the room, uh, up against the wall, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. But that also creates a whole other additional set of issues. Bound Acoustics. Boundary, acoustically, yeah. yeah, boundary interference. That's usually low frequency buildup. You end up with more low end off of the wall than you otherwise want. And that's stuff you have to EQ out later. Mm -hmm. Right, so there's this kind of this philosophy of like, well, do I have the luxury of putting it away from the wall? Yeah, because um, there's other cancellations that can happen there too, yeah. right? But what is the best of both worlds, and what's the best um, compromise yeah. for every every person? And, and it's different in every case. I mean, there's so so there's a distance requirement and an SPL requirement, right? Yeah. So the minimum room distance, the minimum speaker dimension. Like circle or from listening position? So, so just as a whole, right? Okay. So the minimum uh, length of the speakers needs to is like 11 and a half by 10 by 8. Okay. So for instance, you, the speaker should be no lower than 8 feet off the floor, okay. um, 11 and a half feet long, and 10 feet wide. Got it. 
right? In an ideal world, it's uh, 21 and a half by 18 by 10. Good Lord. Right? So, so which is a much larger space, right? And if you're doing that math, now you need a much larger speaker yep. to push that sound pressure to you to hit that reference level at mixed position. And what's the DBL or the SPL requirement? So the SPL requirement varies, okay. um, but but in an ideal world, in a commercial facility, so if it's a, a studio that's being rented out on a regular basis, you're renting your room out or you know whatever a studio, full blown Dolby studio. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah, well they don't certify rooms anymore, but oh, okay. if you want to be onboarded by Dolby's process, they want to see 85 dB per speaker at reference level, okay. plus 20 dB of headroom on top of that. So then the further away the speakers get, the more SPL they have to be capable of. Correct, yeah. And ev everybody measures their speakers a little bit differently, but typically the spec you see on a sheet, mm -hmm. right, a uh, speaker's SPL output mm -hmm. is usually at one meter, so yeah. roughly a little more than three feet. Yeah. Right, at one meter. So, But nobody's really listening to speakers at one meter unless it's like a super home studio near field right. scenario, right? So every time you double the distance, you lose you know, you know, lose 3 dB uh, of level. Got it. So yeah. what's the target at listening position? So target at listening position, you want to be at 85 in a commercial facility. Um, if you're in a private studio yeah. like yours or just a residential studio and you want to be onboarded, they want to see 79. Okay. But ideally, you get as close to that 85 as you can just so you have all the headroom um, you need in order to, to play back whatever comes through. So that speaker size and SPL output grows, the need for it grows exponentially the further the speaker Correct. is away. Correct. And that's where it gets tricky. You know? And you'll see, pe you'll see folks who say, well, that's like way too much speaker for that room. Yeah. And in many cases, the answers can be yes. So th that's why I think the positioning, uh, the, how well the room is treated, all of these things almost get amplified, right? Um, everybody knows how hard placing two speakers correctly in a room, especially if it's a home studio, like my, my little home office, right? Yeah. I, I've got it treated. I've got base panels in the corners. I've you know got four inch thick traps everywhere, yep. um, six inches in the corners, whatever. Still not enough just for my right. single set of two speakers, right? Yeah. Now you put 11 to 13, 14, 15, 16 boxes in a room. Yep. Uh-oh, right? That's a lot to deal with. It's a lot of energy. So you have to, you have to be conscious of, of how that energy interacts with each other and how that's going to affect the translation of, of your mixes out going out the door. What's the minimum quantity of speakers you need to do this? If you want to be onboarded by Dolby, yep. you need to have a minimum of a 7.1.4 system. And could you explain what that means? Yeah, so 7, uh, the first numerical value there, the 7 is the number of surround yep. channels you have. Level. Yeah, all, sometimes you just call them ear height channels, right? So that's your left, center, right channel, your left surround, right surround, left rear, right rear. Yep. So that's, that's 7. Um, you do have the option to add additional width channels. Yep. Um, between the left and the left surround speaker and the right and the right surrounds, or between the side surrounds and the rear surrounds, yep. right? I highly recommend that you do at least a 914 yep. um, because when it comes to the binaural translation, um, that's a really big gap between yep. the left speaker and, say, the left surround. So having those extra width channels is really a, a, a big deal. And then the point one stands for? Yep, so the dot one is the number of LFE channels that are going in the system. Or subwoofers. Well, keep in mind that the dot one doesn't necessarily just mean it's a single subwoofer. Sometimes that LFE channel is driving more than one sub, yeah. right? So that's the number of LFE outputs you have feeding in the system. Okay. Usually it's just one. Um, and obviously your subwoofers, too, need to be capable of base managing um, the system if the speakers are smaller that you're using and you need more low frequency extension. Yep. And then the last digit um, is the number of height channels you have, so the number of speakers you have hanging over your head. So four speakers over the mm -hmm. head. What's the yep. maximum system that you've seen? The biggest one I've seen is an 11.1.6, in, in a studio at least, yeah. But <laughs> but theatrically, there's there's systems that are much larger than that. Yeah. I think they support up to 64 channels. So you decide you want to put in a system. How do you know speaker locations? Speaker locations are pretty simple. Uh, it's, it's usually a set angle, but there is a variance, um, a variability in those angles. So... Um, your left channel and your right channel are at 30 degrees. Your center is kind of your zero degree mm -hmm. setup. And if you go to your surround, your side fill channels, um, those are typically at 100 degrees on center. Um, and then your rears are 135 Got it. Um, around. Now keep in mind, there is a variance here. So 
the good folks at Dolby, they were smart enough to realize like, oh, well, what ha happens if I have a door here, yeah. right? So there's some variability, like for instance, your left surround can go anywhere from or 90 to 110 degrees. So you have 20 degrees of, of flexibility there. Um, but ideally you stick to that layout as, as close as you can. And that's that's the same thing that's true with the previous 5171 standards. Those yeah. are effectively the same. And there's things. software to help you decide all this, right? Yeah, so Dolby makes a tool called the Dart, Dolby Atmos Room Design Tool. Yep. Anybody can download it on the internet. It's totally free. Um, it's actually just a really, really deep Excel sheet. And in this uh, Excel sheet, you can kind of lay out your usable space uh, in your studio, how much space you have to place speakers. Yeah. Um, and essentially it's going to tell you exactly where each speaker needs to go position-wise um, from the corner of the room, the zero, zero of the room. It'll tell you exactly down to, I think, uh, a hundredth of a, a foot. So, nice. you know, two decimal places. Yeah. Um, where the speaker needs to be placed. So it's it's pretty accurate, nice. um, but that's all based on those same um, guidelines, right? Those okay. those same angles yep. from mixed position. So is there any sort of SPL help in Dart? At all? Yeah, Dart also um, has every speaker that you can almost imagine. Oh, wow. um, studio monitor that you can imagine at least on the music side. So there's literally a drop down, and you can select. You know, any Focal speakers, any Atom, Genelec, XYZ, right? Yeah. Um, and it will have, you know, the, the corresponding SPL value for that speaker. And then it'll help the you system. know how far away you can place them. Exactly. So, speaker. yeah, so you place your room boundary in the system. Yep. Um, and it's going to say, okay, here's how far mix position is from each one of these speakers. Mm -hmm. Here's how much SPL level. And it's going to show you how far above, just above, b or below the target SPL level that they require is at the given reference level. With a, whatever given speaker. With whatever given speaker, right? And also things like where the speaker is located. Is the speaker up against the wall? Because you're going to get an SPL boost off of that. Right. Or is the speaker away from a boundary where you're not getting any additive sound pressure from, from the space as well? Got it. So what do you do if you have a room that is smaller than the recommended size? Is there any... Workarounds. Yeah, I would encourage you. Um, one, I think you have to ask yourself: Do you care about being onboarded by Dolby, okay. and do your clients care if you're onboarded by Dolby? Right, that's the largest distinction. Do yes. your Do your clients want someone that know to know that Dolby's approved and put yep. their stamp of okay, this room's good to go, yep. um, or do you care? If the answer is you don't care, you don't. You can use whatever tool you want anywhere. Got it. Right, um, and it's and it's still going to help you understand the system. And maybe the answer is you rough stuff out at home, and then you take it to a room that's approved. You call Colt and you say, "Hey, Colt, I'm going to yeah. come over and run out, run out your space. Um, QC my mixes. Can I come QC and, and tidy up my mixes at your place yep. to to know that everything's good? You can you can totally do that. But there's an expense of doing that, right? Yeah. So it's the balance of that investment and figuring out you know, if that's, if that's worthwhile for that person. Um, but otherwise, I would encourage you, um, Dolby have an onboarding form on their website. Yep. Um, you can fill that out, and essentially um, there's a team at Dolby, a studio enablement team. Um, you've, you've met Emma. Yep. Uh, lots of people have probably spoken with Emma or other people on that team. And they will make some recommendations, or they'll tell you, hey, yeah, you're really under, under spec. This is not something we could onboard. Yep. Or if you're close, they could probably provide some solutions that, that would get you over that edge. And ev eventually, they're the people who push the, the button and put you on the list anyway. So. Is there any sort of like best practices that you've seen? Because you set up a lot of rooms mm -hmm. at this point. Is there any things that you've seen that like when people don't do X, it's always a problem, or when people always do X, it always helps and is worth doing? Is there any scenarios that you can think of? Yeah, there's definitely some. I think the devil's in the details, and you, and you can kind of look at one of the things is it, I look at it almost as like studio like gear planning, right? Like how is all of this stuff going to connect together? But if you're buying an interface, right, that only has a volume control, yep. you need EQ and you need delay in addition to that, right? It's independently for every output. Independently for every output, yes. in order to time align so all the speakers are coming together and yep. to mitigate whatever acoustic acoustical anomalies you may have in the space. You need all that stuff. Um, but you need to also pay attention to how, where they're coming from, where that capability is coming from. Mm -hmm. Because let's say you want to play back from Apple Music, mm -hmm. but Apple Music doesn't run through your interface software, right? Where that EQ and that delay controls, or it can't for one reason or another, got it. right? Because ideally you just want it to be like a desk yeah. and you've got your tape machine on input A, right. you've, you've got Pro Tools 
on input B, yep. you, you know, and you can just quickly jump between and your out and yeah, your sources and your monitor land stays the same. Nothing changes, yep. right? Yep. But if that's the case, you can't. Now all of a sudden you're mixing through a bunch of EQ and delay yep. on this side when you're making a record or you're mixing the record, but now you're listening from Apple Music and you don't have the ability to run that through your system. So is it best to choose an interface that has processing built into it? I think at the moment, yes. I know I can't remember the name of the company, but there's now a plugin that like runs between core audio and everything else that is like a patcher and you can put Sonarworks. You can put any you can put any plug in, but you can put Fab Filter on all your channels before they hit your speakers. Got it. And it also has global monitor control on a software side. Got it. Um, so you could tie an encoder to that, MIDI okay. map an encoder to it, and then all of a sudden you have all of that. that but it's another thing that's too. It's not interface independent. It's not interface dependent. So if you wanted to go with something like I think like some of the latest more budget-friendly interfaces that are Atmos capable don't have room tuning on it. You would need something like this. Yeah, they, they don't. And there, there are some that do, for sure. Yeah. Uh, but definitely the more budget-friendly you know, friendly ones, um, you, Apollos, they have gang monitor control, but they have no EQ yeah. or whatever. So they're relying on something like Sonarworks or a different solution for that. Okay. Um, eventually, I'm sure everybody will have that, right? But like at, at least at the moment, we don't have that luxury. So it's just making sure you have those things. Yep all in one place and just being cognizant of the restrictions you're going to have because one day it's going to happen where you're like ah i wish i would have thought of that so on the system kind of design portion like that's that's really big is just finding something that in in my ideal world you can work the same way no matter what mm -hmm. and all your sources you're able to bring them into the same place and spit them out the same place yeah um, I think the Avid stuff is especially, the Avid and DAD stuff is especially good at this. The dad man yep. is, uh, the learning curve is a lot, yep. um, but it's so flexible. It's it's kind of crazy. Um, but Lynx also have this. Grace also have that with M908. Yep. Um, you know, there's a bunch of RSPE, or RS, not RSP, RS. And when I think, who makes it? Who makes the fire, who made the fire face? RME. RME. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of stuff. Senior to keep track of. senior moments right now. It's a lot of stuff to keep track of, and it's changing so fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's like nonstop. Uh, should I start that over so it doesn't? I don't know if you can fix that and edit. That was pretty bad. <laughs> so yeah, what else are like best practices? Yeah, I mean, uh, aside from like maintaining linearity between your speakers, I really recommend that you use the same speaker everywhere or the same brand and same series of speaker yeah. everywhere. You don't want your tweeters and your to be made of different things or your crossovers to be made of different things or different mid-range drivers or different amplifiers. You want this to feel seamless. Yeah. So it's one thing to get a bigger speaker, but just ensure that they're using all the same materials amongst the speakers. Um, make sure the speakers are hangable. Make sure they have mounting yeah. points on them because not only like it's your safety first of all and everybody who comes in your space is safety so you need to make sure that those things are when they're 50 pounds hanging over your head yeah 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 it's, it's it can be super dangerous and and so making sure that that whatever you have is hangable and safe um is is really important um but beyond that like little stuff like cable management and power mm -hmm. um making sure you don't have if you're gonna spend all this money on a room make sure that you have power outlets within a reasonable distance or a way to conceal that cable and hide that cable so your room looks clean and professional. Because you have to run AC and signal to every speaker independently. If it's an active speaker, now you could you could run a passive box, um, you know, but for the sake of, once again, linearity, you know, throwing a bunch of different power amps into an equation can also be a thing unless you're all passive, yeah. right? So um, just being consistent with that and being clean and following normal studio practices is important. Um, but also things like, I, I don't, not to say that this isn't always the case, but I find in many cases, like using wall mounts, um, unless you're very, very just spot on, you usually have to move things like a few inches here or a few inches there and they don't come as out. As you're tuning the room. Well, not as you're tuning the room, but, oh. but just, like, you know, you've got everything in a CAD drawing, mm -hmm. right? And you come in and here's the speaker placements or the you know the location. the location of each thing yep. right and then you come in and you put a laser down on the ground and you you find your specific angles and one thing's a few inches off or maybe you realize oh that, i wish that rack was a little further back mm -hmm. or i wish i could put my couch there yep. and you can because there's these tolerances right yep. but if you're coming and there's already a, a wall bracket bolted to the wall yeah you know you're you're in a position where you have to adjust those and i've been in that situation where i've showed up and everything was eight inches off 
And you're drilling new holes everywhere. Well, and you're drilling new holes, but what happens if there's power is behind that location, yeah. right? Okay, it was, you know, it, so it's just like, it's just trying to limit the number of variables that you're going to run into. And if it's all your space and you're doing all the planning, right, and you know what you're going to run into, yeah. that's, that's one thing. But it's usually not that simple. It's usually a little more involved when yeah. it comes to a build out like that. In terms of ceiling mounting, there seems to be two options that everyone, that most people go with, right? There's the isoacoustics mounts for high speakers, mm -hmm. and then what, what, whatever the other option is. Do you have a preference? Yeah, there's a bunch of different mounts okay. out there in the world. Uh, they, they all, typically if they're designed to be a mount, they're safe. Yeah. Um, so there's a bunch of, of, of solutions. K&M makes a lot. Um, some companies make their own which is usually K&M making them for them. There's a, a handful of manufacturers that, that make that kind of thing. I typically defer to the isoacoustic stuff just because it gives you an extra layer of isolation between the, the structure of the room, right? And everybody isolates, you've isolated your speakers on isoacoustics yep. for a long time, and that's just isolating your speaker from the stand, and right? The floor. And the floor, yep. in theory. But now we're hanging it in a ceiling where you know that the ceiling may not be as is reinforced sound. well or structurally inert as the floor is yep. right and you pretty much have a big chamber behind drywall in most cases and who knows what the insulation is insulation in my house isn't isn't great yeah. right so now you have like a big drum head almost that's going to resonate because now there's you know something that's vibrating and moving all the time that's coupled to it so the iso, iso acoustics things just kind of knock that out and, yep. and one less thing to worry about one less thing to worry about you know it, the system is a little different than your traditional speaker mounting system but they um, they make some really low profile solutions that are they look nice and clean and they actually help maximize the amount of height that you can have um, between the mount and the ceiling too Got it. Yeah, yeah. Imagine a lot of people are struggling with is their rooms aren't quite tall mm -hmm. enough. If yeah. the minimum height is eight feet for the speaker, yep. a lot of rooms are eight foot ceilings. Yep, eight feet ceilings. So, so that's a that's a challenge, you know. And it's just it, if you have an eight foot room, like it is what it is, you know. We do make some other speakers um, that we haven't spec for your room, but we make um, uh, a speaker series called the One Thousand series, and we have like a low profile sort of six inch or it's actually a four inch depth box Got it's a sealed it. box okay. um kind of like an in-wall sort of in ceiling box um but once again you have to cut into drywall yeah but at least with something like that you're going to maximize your height your height yep. um but it's also a much smaller cabinet volume which yep. means you're going to have less spl output yep. um acoustically it's a more complex thing yep. you know so, so the, there's sacrifices yep. you know um it just depends on the situation. Okay, so I hope that that was informative. Uh, that was really informative to me. So here's what I think we should do. What I want to do or what I did is kind of lay out my needs. What do I need out of a rig? Now, switching from stereo to Atmos, <clears throat> not that I won't work on stereo anymore. Probably two thirds of the work I do will still be in stereo. But putting an Atmos rig in gives me an opportunity to fix a lot of issues that I have with my current rig. And there is one issue that I have with my current rig that has been immensely frustrating since the day that I got it or since the day that I figured this out. And that is hardware insert delay compensation. Now, when I use a, I, you guys know that I use tons of hardware. And when I put these hardware inserts into Pro Tools, there is not an automatic calculation of the round trip it takes for the signal to come out the interface through the hardware back in the interface. That round trip has to be manually calculated by me for every sample rate and for every hardware buffer. Both of these variables change the amount of time that this takes. Now, I came from a Pro Tools HD rig. I was HD for a long time before I started this channel, before you guys ever seen anything from me. I had an HD3 rig, and it manually calculates all that stuff for you. And it was glorious. And there's some other benefits of running an HD system, but that, to me, is the biggest one. Now, if I'm going to invest in an interface uh, to be able to do Atmos, I want to do it in a way where I can get back to this automatic delay compensation. So that is the, the very biggest thing that I'm trying to solve with choosing my gear. The next thing we're trying to solve is speakers, speaker choice, because obviously speakers and interfaces are the two biggest part of putting an Atmos rig together. 
Now, I'm already running the Focal Trio 11s, very happily so. I've been on them for a year or a year and a half, and I absolutely love them. I have no reason to look at any other speakers. Uh, and so it only makes sense that I would tr go with another speaker that played well with that. In my personal opinion, I think it's probably a best practice to go with the same series of speakers for everything if you can, if you can afford it. Now, again, all of this is my personal opinions. I don't want this to be a gatekeeping thing. I don't want anyone watching this video to feel like you have to spend the money that I'm spending. You have to get the quantity or the the high quality of gear that I'm getting in order to do this. I want everyone to experience this. And if you have to go with the very cheapest thing you can possibly muster to get your foot in the door, to start experiencing Atmos, to start working in Atmos, then I think that's what you should do. But there are very specific reasons why I'm choosing the gear that I'm choosing. And I'm very fortunate to have a successful music career in which I can justify these purchases and justify this gear. So I don't have any reason to change out my left and right speakers. I love them. I've already got the Focal Sub, the Sub 12, the big subwoofer, uh, and I love it all. So I've got no reason to change that and not changing that uh, means that I'm saving what, $11,000, $12,000 uh, by not replacing that. So uh, to me, the move, it was just seemed super obvious, is to go with uh, Trio 11's left, center, right. Go with two of the sub 12s because one of them wasn't quite enough in my room and the way the room was treated. We'll see how the room shakes out when it's done being treated. Uh, but I really wanted to make sure that I didn't get all the way through this and feel like I still needed more. I can't imagine I'm gonna need more <laughs> than two of those giant Focal subs. And then I'm gonna go with the Solo 6s all the way, the rest of the way around, and for the height speakers. So in my room, I'm gonna do a 9.1.4. And the reason why I'm doing 9.1 instead of 7.1 was really because of the class I went and took with Mike Miller, who mixed Harry Styles and J-Lo and like just a ridiculous laundry list of people in Atmos and the techniques that he showed us, because a lot of this is how to collapse things down to smaller systems. The One of the most beautiful things about Atmos that surround sound and quad didn't have is the fact that it's automatically scalable. This TV right here has Atmos built into it. And when you play back music, this is a 2.1 system. There's actually a subwoofer on that TV. And when you play back something in Atmos, it automatically folds it down to however many speakers are in the system the music is being played back on. And so that is one of the beautiful things about Atmos is your, your home pods and your Alexas and your TVs and your sound bars and your earbuds and like so many things have Atmos built into them. You have a hard time buying a consumer electronic thing that doesn't have that at this point. However, we do want to control mix translation. It's the same as stereo in the fact that uh, how, our, how well our mixes translate from our studio to the car, to the earbuds, to the laptop, this has always been a really big deal. And this Atmos thing is no different. Unfortunately, one of the things that makes this translation much more accurate is adding the two width speakers, going 9.1.4. So it's the left and right speakers, and then the extra width speakers, and then the side speakers. Because the distance from the side speakers to the left and right speakers, it's a kind of large gap. And that width range, the range in between left and right and the sides, is one of the most important ranges for getting this translation correct. Uh, and so I'm going with 9.1.4 because of that. So speakers, that was an easy choice because I, always, I was already in the Focal world. I already love them. I have no interest in selling them or changing them. It was an easy decision to just go with a whole bunch more Focal speakers to put this rig together. The interface, the, the system, so to speak, um, I have been wanting to go back HD, Pro Tools HD, for years now because I really, really, one, it's an incredible system in a whole bunch of ways. There's a whole bunch more to it than just automatic delay compensation. But for me, I'm, I'm so looking forward 
to having that automatic delay compensation along with all the other benefits of running an HD rig. Now, there seems to be, and I talked to a ton of people. Oh, by the way, I should mention, I went to Sweetwater to their Studio C, which is an all Focal room, and heard the exact system that I'm going to be putting in. It, when I was there, it was Trio 11 LCR with two of the big subs and Solo 6s everywhere else. And I thought it sounded absolutely incredible. So I would encourage you to, before I get b back on the interface, I would encourage you to go listen to a room. If you're going to drop some real money on this, find someone that has the room and go check it out because it's a lot of money. It really is. So it made the decision so much either easier that I could just go to Sweetwater and listen to more or less the same rig that I want to install in a room and really wrap my head around it. Interfaces. With everyone that I've talked to, not people at Avid, but tons and tons of people that have set up lots of Atmos rooms, tons of people that work in Atmos on a regular basis, tons of people that build and set up Atmos rooms. There was one interface that kept being suggested over and over and over, and it was the Avid Matrix Studio. Now, the Matrix Studio is really fascinating for a couple reasons. One, you can run it with an HD system or you can run it standalone via Thunderbolt. So there's a lot of flexibility there. The second reason is that uh, the flexibility and the room tuning is really in depth. The delay, there's delay values for every output. There's EQ on every output. It's an extremely powerful interface for doing an Atmos rig and it takes up one rack space and you can run it with an HD rig or via Thunderbolt. On top of it having really phenomenal sounding conversion because that's that's the next thing i've been on my same interface for going on 10 years now right about 10 years it's it's time um i've made a lot of absolutely incredible music on it i don't necessarily feel it's held me back but there's better sounding things out there now 10 years time to upgrade to whatever i think the best sounding thing is at the moment so we're going back HD, which means an HDX card. Uh, I'm gonna go with the Avid Studio Matrix for the outputs to my Atmos rig. Now this will still leave all or nearly all of my inputs available to track through. I'll be able to track straight into this, which is great. Um, and then I'm for my hardware inserts, since all the outputs on the Matrix Studio are gonna be taken up by speakers, I'm gonna go with an Avid HD IO for all my hardware inserts. So this will give me 16 channels of hardware inserts and I'm only running 14 channels of hardware inserts currently. So this is a step to more IO and it's also scalable because I'll be able to add a second HD IO if I would like to add even more hardware integration. But HD IO, they sound great, they're rock solid, they're, they're reliable, they, like, they work, obviously they're the best thing you can run with an HDX card just because it's all Avid, it all works together. Um, and so I feel like an HDX card with the Matrix Studio for Atmos and the HD, the Avid HD IO for my hardware inserts, to me, this is, this is, seems like the only option for what I want. It seems like the best option. I have, I don't have any, there's no things about this rig that are negatives to me, other than maybe the investment cost. Uh, it's not a cheap rig. However, but I think that this rig, the HDX card with the Matrix Studio and the HDIO, this does absolutely everything that I need a rig to do and is some of, if not the very best gear that you could choose to do these things. So I'm I'm extremely pumped. I can't tell you how much of a relief it is to me to be going back Pro Tools HD. Like, I know it's not for everyone, it is absolutely for me, and I don't plan on ever leaving it again because I have missed it since the moment I left it. Okay, so the next thing we gotta figure out is speaker stands and speaker mounts. Now, I am fully invested in the ISO acoustics world at this point. I've done enough tests. Uh, if you haven't seen my speaker stand comparison video, go watch that video. To me, that was a brutally obvious choice that every set of speakers that I run from here on out will be on ISO acoustics pucks or some sort of ISO acoustics products. These speakers right here are, they're on ISO pucks right now. Um, and my trio 11s in the big room were so 
there is a stand by Argosy, a speaker stand by Argosy, that has the isoacoustic system built into it. So I'm going to go with sound anchors uh, with pucks for my left, center, right, uh, because those will be Trio 11s. I'm already on sound anchors now. They're phenomenal stands. But I don't need that heavy duty or that expensive of a stand for these little solo sixes. There's, that seems like way overkill for me. So Argosy makes a stand that has the isoacoustic system built into it. So I'm going to go with that for all of my surround speakers. Isoacoustics, fortunately, also makes a mount from the ceiling, a ceiling mount to hang my height speakers, and it has the isoacoustics isolation built into the mount. Now, that seems even more important to me maybe than the stands because the floors of our buildings are always structurally reinforced to be strong. The ceilings are not. So I would have to guess that the ceilings we're hanging speakers from in most situations are far more resonant than the floor is. So to me, the height speakers having that isolation is even more important on the height than it is on the ground. So isoacoustics mounts for the height speakers, no question about it, absolutely what I'm doing. Now there's a, there's a workflow situation, there's a feng shui situation in this studio that I needed to overcome because the rear speakers we're kind of going to be like in the middle of the room. Like it just, it's not a great spot. Like you're just going to have to walk around them all the time. My couch was on the back wall, but it, with the couch on the back wall, there'd be big speakers right in front of you with big stands. And that felt weird to me. And also my desk that I was running that had the two sidecars on each side, that felt a little too big and a little too sprawled out for this Atmos thing. So I'm like, how do I s get the desk smaller and still have even more rack space? Because I'm just, I'm always adding gear. I love hardware. I'm never going to stop adding or changing or using hardware. But I still need a place for clients to relax and feel like they're involved in the music creation process. And so my solution to this was to do a producer's desk with racks in between the rear speakers. So that way I have even more rack space. Uh, that way the uh, the speakers aren't sitting in the middle of the room. They can be right on the sides of the rack, or at least this is the plan. And then I'm going to have a top overhang off the back of the racks. So that way it'll be a desk. I can put three or four bar stools there. Clients can sit there. They can be on their computer, they can do whatever they need, they'll be kind of much closer to my front speakers to listen to music as we're working on it than they used to be in my room, while giving me more rack space, while uh, making the flow of the room, the flow of my room, as good as it can be with all of these additional speakers. So I'm going with the Gator racks. Um, and they, they just seem like a really good, solid option. Not really many frills, like just a good, solid rack uh, that holds a lot of gear. And then I need to figure out the top on it. I don't know if I'm going to do wood. I don't know if I'm going to do granite. I don't really know if I'm going to do, you know, butcher block. I'm not really sure what I'm going to do. But I'll have to figure out some sort of top to go on top of all of these racks to hang off the back. So it'll be like a wet bar or like a bar, so to speak. So you can pull bar stools up to it and sit there. So that's my plan for the gear, for the racks. Now there is the task of uh, wiring. It is an astronomical amount of wiring. So I decided to go with all jumpers, cables, and snakes. Uh, I've used some of jumpers stuff before. And to me, jumpers seems to strike the perfect balance between like affordableness, like they're not cheap, but affordableness and also really high quality, like really high quality snakes and connectors while not paying top, top, top shelf prices. So to me, that struck the best balance. So the entire studio will be outfitted with jumpers, cables and connecting the back rack to the front desk took some really special, some really special length cables, some snakes. And so after I had ordered a bunch from Sweetwater, a bunch of the snakes, then I was like, oh, I still need these custom links that are like 35 feet. And Sweetwater's like, yeah, we don't carry any of that. We're not, we don't mess with any of that custom stuff. 
So I just sent them a message. I think it was on Instagram. I just sent jumpers a message on Instagram. And I was like, hey, I need however many I needed. I've got it all listed out. I need a bunch of these 35 foot DB25 to XLR snakes. Can you make those for me? And they're like, absolutely. So I told them exactly what I needed, put the order in. They shipped the next day. I, I don't look. I'm going to be honest. I don't know if it's because they they thought it was they knew it was me. I don't know what the situation was, but the fact that I put an, a custom order in for some crazy length snakes and it shipped out the next day and the following day it showed up at my house. I, I'm really really impressed by that. So great customer service, good quality, like great quality products, great quality connectors. They sound good, and on the affordable end for a very high quality snake, very high quality cable. So that's it, jumpers, cables in the whole rig for everything, all the snakes, everything. Okay, patch base. I've been running TRS, TRS patch base for a long time. However, I need a whole bunch more ins and outs in this new rig. It seemed like a good opportunity to check out what you, many of you guys have been suggesting to me absolutely forever is the flock patch bay. Now, what the Flock Patch Bay is, it's a digital patch bay. Uh, it's full analog signal path. The signal never gets converted to digital, but it is fully digitally controlled. So you can save presets and profiles or whatever. I, I haven't even used it yet. Um, but you can save presets of, oh, I want inputs, inputs and outs the loop uh, channel 11 on the HDIO to go through this bunch of hardware. And you can digitally change the patch points, no patch cables, and then you can save that. So the beauty of this is with the quantity of hardware that I'm going to have and the quantity of songs that I'm going to work on, I'm always trying to figure out how to make things faster and more efficient. And I don't want to be locked down to certain hardware chains on a bunch of different songs. I want to have the flexibility to use a bunch of stuff, but there's a time penalty to that. Repatching stuff in, taking notes for every song. So I finally went with it, what you guys talked about, the, fl the Flock Patch Bay. I'm really pumped to try it out. I'm really pumped to see how it sounds. I'm really pumped to see how the workflow works out. But the idea that I will just be able to patch absolutely any hardware in on the computer and then save that as a preset in the song folder. And then when I'm jumping back and forth between songs, it's like, it should just be like one click and it will automatically patch in all my hardware, how I had it for that song. Now I will still have to do hardware recalls like on the knobs. And I do all that with photos with my cell phone, every song, I finish the song and I take photos of every, of all the gear. And then those photos get stored in the song folder. Uh, and that is how I do my mix recalls. But Flock Patch Bay, I'm really looking forward to trying it out. Now I want to give a huge thank you to Josh from Focal and to Gavin, Gavin Haverstick from Haverstick Designs because the quantity of emails that have went back and forth between those two guys, deciphering not only the build of the whole rig, but deciphering exact speaker locations and helping me know exactly what to do, I, like they have been so incredibly helpful. Both of them, both Gavin and Josh have been so incredibly helpful. I'll drop both their Instagrams down below. Please go follow them. Go hit them up if you're interested in doing this sort of thing. Like, I, I cannot stress how helpful they were and how much easier this process has been because of them. Just realized Andrew Masters is on my, Andrew Masters is on my background here because I was editing the thumbnail for the last video. <laughs> you guys been staring at Andrew Masters' face this whole time? That's hilarious. Now there's a couple things that I still need to figure out. For instance, a monitor control. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to go with like the Avid dock for a monitor control. You know, if there's going to be some sort of dedicated monitor controller. Right now, the monitor controllers for Atmos are kind of all in one systems in terms of they've got the room tuning and different profiles and, and the volume control and all of that built right in. I don't really anticipate needing that. I think I just need a volume control. So I still need to figure out what the the easiest way to integrate a, just a volume control is. I will probably still need to figure out a way to patch in like my Oratones 
or an alternate set of speakers because my plan as I work through all this is to mix each song one time and to do both the Atmos and the fold down to stereo simultaneously. And the fold down to stereo will get a traditional mix bus chain on it and, the, and do it all at once and then I can print two versions and be done. Well, if that's what I want to do, I still do need alternate sets of monitors for different references to check on. So there's a couple things still to figure out, uh, but I feel really good about this decision, uh, this selection of gear. Uh, I have had people ask me what I'm gonna do with all this hardware when I'm in Atmos. Now, it's too early to tell, but for me, I still can't get the sound in my head out the speakers without hardware. And so we'll see if that remains the case as I move through this process. What likely will happen, since Atmos is largely like a stereo stem-based platform, to me, having just a whole bunch of different stereo processing units to put on different stems, I mean, that, that seems like the way to integrate hardware into Atmos to me at this point. Now, I will put links down below for every single piece of gear that I talked about in this video. And those links do go to Sweetwater, even though Sweetwater absolutely did not send me all this stuff for free. But I will put links down below and those links do go to Sweetwater. And anytime you guys need any piece of musical gear, you can jump on any one of my videos and click on any one of the links down below. And once you've clicked on those links, you can purchase anything that you need that you were gonna purchase already anyway. And it costs you nothing extra and it goes a long ways to help me keep making videos like this. So thank you, Sweetwater, for sponsoring this video. Thank you guys for clicking on those links anytime you need to purchase anything. Okay, I think that's it. We'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.